and welcome along to the Panto Podcast. This week my guest is Danny Rogers. In this episode he tells me all about his first appearance on stage, his love of patter songs, and of course we speak about his father, the legendary Ted Rogers. So please sit back and enjoy the latest Panto Podcast. My guest for today's Panto Podcast is Danny Rogers. Hello, Danny. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yeah, good. We've been chatting for hours <laughs> already. And you've come from a, a famous famous dynasty, shall I say. <laughs> um, your dad's, Ted's, obviously a huge influence on you. Yeah, well, from, well, from, well since growing up, really. Yeah. Uh, watching him in shows, summer seasons and pantomimes and things. Um, and my mum was a raw ballet dancer, so to be a plumber was out of the question <laughs> in that sort of way. Um, but yeah, uh, I sort of loved it. Any chance I could, I would see him in a in a show and um, whether it be, as I said, summer seasons or commercials or pantomimes, there would always be him on one side on stage and there'd be me in the wings that would be mimicking his every, every move. Ever since I was a kid, I was very much of that's what I want to do I want to be where my dad is right now I want to be in that sort of environment so yes anything else was definitely not on the agenda so lucky enough maths and well well, English to a degree but yeah maths was never my strongest (laughs) point so um yeah that's that's always how I saw it for me really how are your friends then with it with with having a famous dad um well a bit weird because since they didn't grow up in in sort of the prime time that my dad was for them they didn't really they didn't really know as such it'd be mainly their parents obviously that they'll be going oh you know that's that's a Ted Rogers son you should you should get you should befriend him (laughs) (laughs) go get a picture of the bin quick (laughs) so for yeah it didn't really sort of come across really as such I think obviously as I said more the parents I think they were very much quite excited by the fact um but when it came to sort of me to be with my mates it was just quite quite simple quite down to earth nothing sort of asking sort of questions of or what what was it like being what's dad like being on tv is it hard and so it was just basically a kick about on like on the pitch or something like that or the park or whatever so that didn't seem to be too different from any sort of limelight as such um although hilariously did get one sort of uh class member that said oh you you driving those sort of cars you're not like driving like the fancy cars and then my dad said oh we we have the fancy cars we just don't use them for the school run <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah otherwise it was just quite simple times really nothing nothing too strenuous in the whole um what was your dad doing things what was funny was i guess because my dad was who he was nobody need to ask that question so i didn't really go oh, what does your dad do because i kind of thought well i might be being a bit rude now and asking <laughs> that sort of question so uh, I'll, I'll i'll leave that for a later point really um but yeah it was yeah completely changing that sort of way really what's your earliest memory then of theater uh oh that's a question um I remember being, uh, my dad was in summer season in Whitby and I remember I had like a uh, puppet, a rabbit puppet and for some unknown reason, I don't know how I got this puppet or whatever, um, but I remember saying to him, oh, I would love to like come on stage with my puppet, is that at all possible? <laughs> but bless him, he had a word with the stage manager, so look, is it alright if, if Danny just comes like for the walk down with his puppet? And sure enough, I did and the audience must have thought, was this hacked up? We don't remember seeing this act, <laughs> and just come down the, down the stairs after like all these like people who were on this bill with this random rabbit puppet. So <laughs> where that came from, I don't know. Um, but yeah, that was I guess my earliest memory. But since my uh, birthday is a week before Christmas, um, my dad was always a regular sort of doing pantomime season. So for me, it was just the norm. It'd be like, right, I'm off school. It's my birthday, right? Dad's in panto. So literally I would watch his pantos every single day and wouldn't get bored of it at all. I'd be constantly laughing at the same jokes that they'd be doing all the time. And always pointing out, you did something a bit different there. That didn't go to plan, did it? And like, yeah, you spotted that one. Cheers, thanks for that. Um, but yeah, I loved it. Um, I remember dad was sometimes would get me sort of doing stuff behind the scenes um, and certainly in Panto sort of pressing buttons that would blow up a microwave or an oven or something in the kitchen scene and then sort of 
tinkering around with like the lights and this, that and the other. So he very much could see that I wanted to be sort of part of this industry and theatre and trying his best to sort of put me in any direction. And people who were in the theatre that we were in were very, well, very like pleasing in the fact that they let me do all that sort of stuff because sometimes there's a lot of business going around with stage hands and crew and stage coming in and this that and the other so for them to do that as well was uh very very nice it sounds like a great exciting time for you when you were little yeah were, were you at all apprehensive of being backstage uh, uh no I, I guess not i always remember my dad sort of saying to him just make sure you don't get in anybody's way so i was like <laughs> okay yes fine that's not a problem um but no not at all i guess from you being like a young age as a kid i sort of everything like you just go out your mind you don't feel sort of conscious or anything you're constantly like oh what's going on here what are we doing <laughs> so i was a bit more open whereas i know uh, with my sister she sort of was but then I think as she sort of grew older she's like oh no no I, I don't want to I'll, I'll just stay to the dressing room it's fine I'll keep in there um, but we would sometimes go and sort of sit in the audience and especially when it was the kids spot um, for volunteers and things both me and my sister would normally put our hands up and hilariously on one um, show I think both Kanna and I were up on the stage with dad and he pretended he didn't know us and was asking my sister all these questions what's your name where you come from how old are you and, and after one of the questions she went well you should know you're my father and the whole audience just erupted <laughs> which was uh which was brilliant um but yeah we uh, it was just magic sort of times really just very very lucky in the fact that we got to see a show for free your dad's in it you get a part to be part of the kids spot maybe get some prizes that go yeah. along with it maybe not all the time because you need to give some of the prizes to the other kids um but yeah it's just magic honestly just magic um and i know for me especially as soon as i saw uh dad and dusty in the song sheet if i could be in the wings or out um, in the audience i would that would be my favorite part because hearing everybody sort of cheer and sing the Dusty Bin song. I was just uh, mesmerised by it all, really. Um, yeah, I loved it. For me, that was that was Christmas. That was part of my Christmas normality. That's what I enjoyed uh, doing and being a part of. And then from there, that sort of inspired me, really, to do, uh, do it myself. Um, I was quite lucky. My dad was doing summer season in Weymouth uh, with Bernie Clifton and Bonnie Langford. Um, and I was 10 at the time and I, it was sort of the first time I was beginning to sort of do stuff and sort of on stage with sort of pros as, um, Bernie, he had, I can't remember with the bit with his act, but he would have like a crossover routine and he had his little dog, I think it was a Jack Russell and he would want me to walk it across the stage. I can't remember what the gag was, but for some weird reason, I thought it'd be hilarious to be in my Chelsea strip just to like go along the stage with it. Um, so he got me to do that and then he had a um, inflatable scuba diver um, and he would deflate it and then he would have somebody, a, a stagehand on the, in the wings with a microphone blowing raspberries and my dad said, well look, he's, Danny's very good at blowing raspberries, you should get him to do it. So we had the thing of the huge scuba diver deflating and then just the raspberries that were blowing thing, it was a sound effect and go, who's that? And then would pull me on stage and go, oh, shut up and then push me back off again. Um, so got me doing that and then uh then dad then brought me on in my sort of suit and we both did the three two one sign and then came off so that was sort of a nice sort of lead into being on stage with uh other pros and things and then i was quite lucky to go back onto that stage myself doing a summer panto that was pirates of the pavilion so it was very weird and the fact that it's all sort of come back full circle really in that sort of way of being on that stage uh me performing doing uh, my own stuff sort of without without them there which is uh quite weird have you always wanted to be on the stage then was there any sort of plan b no which i suppose is probably a bad thing <laughs> in some ways um no it's constantly like right this is what i want to do i can't see uh anything else that i would would want to do or would like doing it was always to be something in in theater uh, performing or um sort of behind the scenes something in that sort of environment um i just found it was just magic a way of sort of expressing myself and getting the response from an audience is well there's just nothing else nothing else like it really um 
and watching my dad sort of get that response, it was just, well, he's enjoying himself and they're enjoying themselves. Oh, this, I would love to do this. This is, uh, this, this is perfect. Um, if you can get the work, fine, <laughs> carry on. But yeah, it was, there was no sort of looking back really. That was definitely the path I wanted to go into. So, um, I kind of looked into avenues of, um, as I was sort of getting older, my dad sort of did Butlin's red coat. So I went off to do work experience when I was 16 as a Butlin's red coat entering, um, guests coming in at Butlin's and Bogner. um, and doing kids activities and things sadly because since I wasn't 18 I couldn't do anything with the adults I was too young so um did that and then went off um sort of doing a degree in musical theater at the same time entertaining in Mallorca doing daytime activities and then entertainment for the adults and things in the evening so that was a seven day week so that was a, a good apprenticeship to start off in uh, the world of showbiz as they say um, and then after graduating, I got my first uh, tour in Panto that was with uh, Wonder Productions. And then it just sort of seemed to build from there, really, just sort of getting each bit as each way, as each year went by, sort of say, so to speak. So, um, yeah, as long as it sort of kept going in that way, there was no sort of looking back of, right, what else could I do? So I was sort of trying my best to get in any avenue and then in any craft that I could in that sort of way. What kind of things then do you think, Dad, you're still um, emulating from your dad? Uh, I guess, uh, uh, sort of, well, patter songs, I would say. My dad was sort of famous for doing those, so I've sort of learned quite a lot of those sort of routines and being brought, brought up with Danny Kay, who I was named after, so learning those as well. Um, so those are just sort of part of my DNA, really. Um, I guess sort of pantomimes, essentially, and sort of summer shows um, and doing sort of singing bits of cabaret. So all those bits I've kind of picked up from dad and most of his jokes sort of along the way. So I've picked up all these sort of uh, skills and things that he's kind of passed on to me. So, yeah, very much in the uh, apple that doesn't fall far from the tree <laughs> and that sort of line. Um, I guess there isn't a huge part of me that isn't that different from him I suppose I guess I don't do uh, as much sort of topical material as my dad would have done I guess I'm sort of more in the sort of acting sort of side of things but everything else is pretty much still the same really um, I wouldn't say there's any sort of different in that otherwise I suppose any particular favourite patter songs that you mentioned? Uh, well, I love the, uh, there's a song called Tchaikovsky that was um, in a musical called Lady in the Dark, which was, I think it was written specifically for Danny Kay by the writers that were Kurt Weill and um, Ira Gershwin. And it's uh, basically, it's 50 Russian composers that are rattled off in about 32 seconds which that's where Danny Kay got his big fame in Broadway from there on in. So um, obviously my dad sort of learned it. And then I kind of, I think I started learning that song when I was apparently about seven. But I think that was more like the, the, the Kofsky, the, the Kofsky, which wasn't, <laughs> wasn't exactly how it should be performed. But yeah, as the years went by, I sort of uh, picked it off. So I think that sort of, I guess if you call it a party piece as such, that's sort of the number one. But I also liked uh, the other ones that my dad sort of did, which was The Auctioneer. Um, that's quite a nice one. But then I've, I found another one, which was uh, quite a good one, which is The Museum Song, which is from Barnum, uh, which it wasn't until actually seeing, because um, I've never seen the musical, it was from watching Brian Conley in an interview saying that he had quite a far sort of patter song to learn. And I was like, oh, What's this? What's this patter song? Let's see what this one is. And I was like, Oh, right, right, okay, that's a that's a fair nifty one. So that was uh, quite nice, sort of different to go away from what my dad's sort of take on was. It was nice to learn a completely new one I hadn't heard of before. Um, but there's also other ones. That's the um, I've been everywhere, man, which is an English version. Um, uh, that was uh, one that I sort of seemed to pick up. But I think I remember my dad sort of saying it. So that's why I knew in the back of my mind. I think that's from somewhere um so yes I, but i would definitely say yeah the tchaikovsky one out of all of them i think that's the most impressive um i would say you know what i'm going to ask now don't you You want me to do it don't you <laughs> would you mind for our <laughs> lovely listeners around the world giving it just a, a, 
if, if you're if you're filling up to it of course <laughs> yes <laughs> the vocals are still there I think I can still do it uh, so there's Maliszewski, Rubinstein, Arensky and Tchaikovsky Sepelikov, Dmitry, Evcherenko, Kuzinovsky Gadovsky, Andrzej Buczymoni, Usawaki, Mego Slobia, Prokopriev, Tionko, Rolls, Tingle There's Glinda, Winter, Botniaski, Repikov, Felizki There's Meta, Barakirbs and Torov, Angolczyski And Sokolov and Kopolov, Tukowski and Kolovsky Shostakovic, Boradin, Lier and Olekovsky There's Liadov and Kagarov, Makevich, Manchego Darek, Mispishev, Jevskalani, Vasilego Serenzin, Siv, Kosakov, Mazowski, Ingrashanov Glazanov, Anasitza, Wikarini, Kafat, Manav Oh, brilliant, thank you <laughs> And what was that in English? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I couldn't tell you that, I'm afraid. <laughs> what about a song sheet then? Because you must love doing the song sheet. Yes, I love doing a song sheet. Uh, Favourite song from a song sheet, is that what you're asking? Well, or? just song sheets in general. I mean, you know, the, the audience reaction with children. You yes. said about your dad and you know, getting you up. And I think what I like about it is the fact, and sort of, I used to be quite scared about it to begin with, is the fact it's the part of the pantomime that is not rehearsed. Anything can happen, <laughs> and hopefully it won't. <laughs> and that sort of means. Um, but no, I love it, especially when you've got um, some children that come out that literally just want to tell you everything they've got for Christmas, or what's literally just happened in like the like past few minutes, or they want to tell you, I don't know what what's just happened in the show that made them laugh so much and things. I think it's it's lovely because you, I mean, in Panto you do break the fourth wall, but it's going that extra step completely by getting them up on stage and then what's nice is the fact that that they feel mostly part of the show they're like oh we've seen these characters but actually now we're, we're, we're with you we're part of this and it's nice for the families to, as well to see their kids who get up on stage and perhaps for the first time see a pantomime and go oh gosh before they wouldn't do anything like this and now they're up and there's I don't know 2,000 people watching them and they're just trying to play a tambourine or <laughs> trying to sing a song <laughs> or something um, so I just think it's magic. It's it's the whole reason why pantomime works, isn't it? Really, it's it's that generation of inspiring new people into theatre and getting them up and up and doing it. I mean, I I I used to love sort of being part of of in that sort of environment because there's nothing else like it really. Um, there's people watching your every move of what you're doing, and it could be it could be silly, it could be funny. Um, but uh, I, I, I think it's, I think it's especially fun when you've got a mischievous sort of child and you can keep sort of playing with who their, who their parents are. Have they had a nice time? Has mummy and daddy had a falling out yeah. or something? <laughs> Did they get you the right Christmas present? No. When are you going to take it back tomorrow? Oh. <laughs> I don't know. But no, I, uh, I think it's just magic, really, really, really nice. And also to get. Uh, kids up and them singing along with a with a song that might be a might be an old song that nobody's heard of that they they start to listen to or it could be a song that everybody knows and they just enjoy it could be baby shark i mean i know that goes on <laughs> but but at least they're getting involved that's the main thing and in inspiring those sort of people i mean i know with my dad's song sheet i think he did i think he used to do too he used to have people kids up on the bench and he would interview them and then he would sing a song called Mysterious People, which was, I think it was a Val Dunican song. And then halfway through, he used to move up and they'd get the kids up to sit on the bench. And the other ones would try their best to be hanging on for dear life, not to be pushed off this bench, <laughs> which was just hilarious to watch. Um, and then after that, they used to bring used to bring Dusty on with their with their prizes from the uh, song sheet. And then after that, we do the Dusty Bing song with everybody to join in. So that was quite nice. And the fact it got kids up and and part of something, and then getting the whole audience to be part of a a song sheet. So yeah, I like those sort of two combined into one. But I know there can be loads of different sort of song sheets. It just depends on what you want to do. It could be a Music Man, could be uh, McDonald, but. I think it either or as long as as long as the kids up and enjoying themselves, then that's the main thing. What's your favourite role to play then in pantomime? Uh, I'd have to. Oh, well, I guess I have to say comic. You can you can get away with quite a lot more. I'd say if you if you're principal boy, there's only so much you can get away with. I think got to be clear on the script. But I think if you're a comic or or a dame or a, or a or a baddie, you can get away with certain bits. But I think a comics quite nice in the fact you do get the rapport with like the kids um especially if you're a but buttons or a, or a muddle sort of part you get more in the fact that you love the girl but she doesn't love you so they feel even more sort of sorry for you so you can sort of play off that in that sort of way um but i have played the baddie uh once i did do that and i 
I did find that quite enjoyable. And the fact that you get all the all the booze. What part was that then? Uh, so that was Abanaza. I was I, I was playing. Put you down as a <laughs> Well, the eyebrows, I think yeah. maybe right. <laughs> <laughs> that might give it some something. But no, I I did that actually at a uh, Warner Leisure Hotels. We did a, a pantomime there of Aladdin. So I got to play Abanaza there. But yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed. And the fact that you could really play off the sort of mean but sort of charming sort of persona as it were and try and get the crowd to really give you a good a good grueling <laughs> because you're one of these rare and please don't take this the wrong way but you're one of these or oh, any comedians listening please don't take this the wrong way <laughs> but you're one of these comic characters who's good looking <laughs> um, <laughs> well, I think, when do you want the check <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's <laughs> You've just fed me, so of course I'm going to be very complimentary <laughs> to you. But the you don't really find that many good-looking or n- no well, normal-looking comedians, <laughs> to be fair. Um, they they all have a bit of a quirk to them, and you're they do yes. You're, you're just well, I've got big ears and bushy eyebrows, so I just need the brace for the set. <laughs> <laughs> but no, I know I get what you mean, and the fact that I think. I, I don't know. I, 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 I never, and only when I sort of play sort of principal boy sort of parts, I thought, okay, well, maybe there's a good, good looking sort of part <laughs> to me in that way. I never would have cast <laughs> myself in that way, shape or form. But I think if you've, if you've got something funny about you, I think you're immediately, the audience are just already, you, you've won them straight away. Whereas, I don't know, I wouldn't say I'm like the best like like Clark Gable in the world but I think <laughs> I think you've probably got a bit of a harder task in some ways I don't know in that sort of uh environment I think if if you've got a sort of funny sort of walk I suppose or something you might need to justify it in another way potentially I, I'm not sure um to get them sort of <laughs> laughing it's a very weird sort of thing to say oh I'm actually all right I don't know if I can make this funny or not I don't know you do get um it's quite rare to find somebody who can play principal boy and then comic. Yeah. Um, I've never known that before. Um, and in terms of your dad, you know, good looking man. Yeah, he's quite a, a rare. We were talking. Got good genes. <laughs> but we were talking about this before. We were, I said that um, I think your dad and Dave Allen, mm. yes. the Irish comedian, were about the only two good looking. B- B- male, comedians, male comedians. yes, and it's it must be quite difficult to go out there and not look mm. funny. Mm. Well, I know, I know what my my dad used to do is the fact he always uh, he was he was always a persona of wanting to look immaculate. Like, I think he used to have sort of suits that the pels like matched his shoes. I think he wanted to give off that mm. vibe. How that works for a, an audience, I don't know. I guess he. He always saw, sort of saw it in the fact that as soon as you go out on the stage, people were judging you from the word go. So kind of wanted that fact of, well, if I look immaculate, then you've got nothing to really say straight away. <laughs> well, look at me first and then see how we go. <laughs> in that sort of lines. Um, but yeah, I guess it sort of comes with a certain sort of style and things like that, doesn't it really? I mean, as we were talking earlier, Les, Les Dawson, you only needed to look at him and you're just, laughing straight away i mean tommy cooper famously was for that as soon as he walked out everybody was in fits of laughter and he had said one <laughs> word in fact i think he used to get annoyed he used to say why are people why are people laughing at me i haven't done anything yet <laughs> so, Joe, but so true isn't it like? yes very much so did dad see you perform much when you were little uh any sort of school plays uh and things like that hilariously i used to as i said I, i'd be um, sort of learning Danny Kay routines because that's what we were sort of brought up with, with as kids sort of on his films and uh, CDs and such um, because I used to watch uh, Dad sort of do his Danny Kay sort of uh, routines as well I wanted to try and pick them up so I was kind of a bit sort of embarrassed I would get him to sort of be outside the door of my bedroom and I'd be singing alongside the uh, Danny K CD and then we'd finish it and then after that I would like let him come in and then sort of give me the uh, the what what he thought <laughs> it was it good was it bad was it all right can I improve there which was which was lovely which I I, I think now I kind of took for granted at the time but looking back I think oh that actually meant quite a lot 
and that sort of means really I mean at school I think the only thing he saw me in was sort of like Christmas sort of like plays and maybe like the king of the rats where I played one of the rats there wasn't a lot really to sort of digest and go well to be a rat you should do this <laughs> as such um but uh but yeah he was very much uh supportive uh in in doing it and I do remember actually going back to Tchaikovsky he would sort of say oh no no that needs to be pronounced a bit better there you need to go back here and relook at it and things so it was it was nice in fact that he was telling like a young boy to like be doing this rather than going oh you shouldn't be doing that you should be just you know go outside and play football what are you doing like he was very much in the fact of oh actually he's interested in this right okay let's uh let's have a, a little see what you've got and let's try and see if i can help i mean hilariously actually i do remember um sort of thinking in the fact that uh, I always wanted to do sort of shows uh, for my dad so I would sort of get dressed up in a suit and I would normally wrote my sister in going well you can sort of do a bit of like songs and things I'll host it and uh, we'll swap from bedroom to bedroom and you get changed into something we never planned it it was never planned it was literally like right I'll just try and fill in with some chatter and a bit of dad's old like routines or whatever and you just you come in the middle which bless him he was very good at sort of being patient and watching <laughs> you've said a lot about dad but what about mum? Uh, yes, well, mum, uh, bless her, she was sort of watching things, but uh, because um, mum wasn't sort of mentally sort of well, she couldn't really take in as much what was sort of going on. So she was sort of uh, attentive about it and things. Um, but because of her illness and stuff, she couldn't really give off as much stuff. So I think dad was sort of more sort of, pushing alongside there really I mean she was a world ballet and bluebird dancer but bless her we didn't really see her sort of dance as as much I suppose but she was always um never sort of like said anything sort of bad about performing and things I mean yeah she did like say it's going to be hard work which she definitely wasn't wrong in that sort of factor but never in the fact of sort of saying um no no don't do it or you shouldn't be doing this or whatever so she was always very supportive in that way about uh, performing and such. What kind of mover are you then? Are you a good mover? Uh, well, it takes me a while to pick something. <laughs> Once I've got it, I'm fine. <laughs> but it's it's just getting there, I suppose. But uh, uh, I wouldn't. I I definitely couldn't say that I would be at the Royal Ballet like that. <laughs> I, I definitely didn't get my mum's jeans, unfortunately, on that side. <laughs> um, but I, I I guess yes, I can I can I pick it up. And once you've got rehearsals and things, it all comes to play. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't say I'm the fastest at picking something up. But once I've got it, I'm not too bad. Um, but uh, but yeah, definitely not. I wouldn't be in the I wouldn't be in the kick line. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> Who else then are your influences for now? Uh, well, I. I I used to love, I mean, Sally's past, but I used to love, uh, like, Ken Dodd. I uh, used to love watching him. And Robin Williams uh, stand up in films. I used to love his uh, comedy um, and, and things like that. Um, so I guess they were kind of influences. Um, definitely from watching Ken Dodd. I remember I watched him, uh, I think I first went to see him when I was 16. And bless him, it was hilarious because I saw him... Um, before his show started, <laughs> which I think was a bit of dangerous because it, uh, he was notorious for sort of, well, his show's going on for so long, to the fact that he was chatting for us so long that the stage man was like, um, Ken, I really don't want to bother you, but uh, your show's starting in like two minutes. <laughs> um, so that was uh, really sort of generous. But yeah, I got to see him uh, another two times after that. And hilariously, I went to see him with uh, Andy Eastwood um when we were both in panto together andy said to me look I'm, i've got tickets to go and see ken dodd do you want to go with me well what do you say no <laughs> so i was like yes yes please um so yes we went to go and see him and uh and nearly about three quarters of the way of his act he said uh i'm going to get the sword that's going to go on one shoulder and the other shoulder and hopefully uh my head won't be chopped off and we all thought it was a gag we didn't think anything else of it and thought oh gosh he's actually being serious he's going to be knighted and uh, the audience just went in hysterics and then we got to see him afterwards um, and had like sort of celebrations with champagne and things and um, 
he was really funny because he thought he was going to have his honours taken away because he announced it a good few days before the list had come oh. out. So he was petrified that they were going to go, sorry, you can't have that now. Um, but no, it was lovely, um, especially on that sort of uh, celebration because he uh, remembered me and was chatting to me saying, oh, what are you doing now? Are you still performing and things? And it was awkward because he had all the acts in his dressing room and the whole room went silent. And it was just me and him chatting. I thought... Oh, somebody talk or something somebody <laughs> drop something at least this is all eyes is on me and him right now um but no just so generous really so generous um in his time especially after performing for that long i couldn't uh believe his generosity and that sort of factor you kind of thought gosh i've i fit i finished now i need to i need to rest up but in his 80s and still like so what do you want to do do you still like doing this are you still performing you should be doing this so um, just amazing because I don't I mean I'd probably sound a bit cynic now but I can't imagine sort of comedians of today sort of doing something like that I kind of feel that that might be like right the the gig's over right want to get in the car and, and go I don't know I, I, I feel that with with Ken Dodd it was something or Sir Ken Dodd shall I say it was something different really there'll never be another no no definitely not no very no very sad when, uh, when he went but no marvellous marvellous man Really, really lovely. Um, and hilariously, I think he actually put a note on my dad's car that said, which was apparently it was untidy, it said, cleanliness counts, Ted. And I did ask him about it. <laughs> and I said, did, did you do that? And he went, mm, possibly. <laughs> which I thought was lovely. Um, but yeah, marvellous man. Yeah, definitely a huge, huge influence to me, as uh, certainly to a lot of other uh, performers uh, across the country, I'm sure. Um but yeah, and Robin Williams, that was, well, it was through uh, my dad sort of watching. We we watched, uh, I think it was Live at the Met, I think it was, with Robin Williams. And just thought it was marvellous. Just so, so, so quick. I mean, I know he was on, <laughs> he was on something, so I suppose he would be. But <laughs> but um, not for, not an influence on that way. But certainly performing wise was just amazing. And then his films, well, that was uh, something, something else really. Um, so yeah, I would say definitely Robin Williams and uh, so Ken Dodd, they're two big influences as well as as well as my dad. Really, they were definitely big ones that I would sort of say wanted me to go in the world of show business. I've got somebody looking at me at the moment in your <laughs> in your living room, um, and it's the cat. He's <laughs> <laughs> no, this uh, this this is a. a a, a big refuse receptacle, I believe, is the word. Or as yes. us Brits lovingly know him as Dusty Bin. Yes. Beautiful. Um, how come you've got Dusty <laughs> Bin in your living room? <laughs> well, um, well, obviously, well, uh, that being thrown to three to one, he had uh, Dusty Bin, for people who don't know, was the booby prize uh, for the game show three to one. So if anybody... Uh, one dusty bin has won the prizes. Unfortunately, as people thought, they would win him, but they did not. <laughs> All they got was a brand new dustbin. Um, so, with the success of the show, um, he obviously had um, people saying, "Look, oh, would you come with dusty bin?" So he got a special one uh, made uh, from the guy in Roly that made him, and. Um, at a certain time he did he, uh, he was in my bedroom as a young boy was dusty <laughs> um so i was one of the lucky few that actually had a real life dusty bin as they say so uh he's been i guess with me ever since really um hilariously enough actually there was a um a theater that my dad did uh, panto in at the billingham and forum and the guy who was the stage crew there wingy who had been there uh, I think he's been there quite some years and said to me when I came to play there, oh, your dad said that, that Dusty would be yours one day. And then sure enough, uh, it is. So uh, yes, he resides with me now. Um, and then I do a one man show about that, that uh, he now features in called uh, Bin and Gone. So I couldn't do a show without dad, without Dusty Bin. I don't think, I don't think it would be a, a show without him really. Um, but yes, quite a mischievous sort of character back in the day, but still goes. So that's the main thing after, I think he's 40 years old, I want to say. 
And he still moves. And he still moves. Doesn't look bad. He doesn't at all. <laughs> He's so much fun. It really is. <laughs> An honour to be stared out by. <laughs> yes, I know. Yeah, you won't win a blink contest with him, I'm afraid. <laughs> so the show, been and gone. Yes. Um, first of all, how did you decide on this tribute to your dad and to tell his story? Well, I guess it started from um, I went to see Bob Golding in a one-man play called Morecambe. Um, and I heard great things about it because it played the Edinburgh Fringe and it got huge reviews. I went to see it down in Worthing and I thought, well, um, that's marvellous. And then other things sort of seemed to creep up that there was uh, Wisdom of a Fall that was done by Jack Lane about Norman Wisdom. Um, and then there was another one about uh, Larry Grayson. And I thought, well, I would love to do a show about uh, my dad um, before anybody else sort of got there in the means and sort of pay tribute to him, really. So that kind of sparked it. Um, and uh, I kind of thought, well, I, I don't think I can really write it because I wouldn't know where to start. So um, at my uh, school that I went to, French Mites, uh, the stage manager there of our s sort of small theatre, he sort of went and did a little hunt around of anybody who might be interested. And then a name came of Tom Glover. He met up with me. Um, I sort of spoke to him about um, my myself, about my dad and things. Um, and he said, OK, yes, I think we can build something together on this. Um, but not as a sort of play that you just play your dad. I think it's got to be focused that it's your story as well as your dad's story. I think that's how the angle to make it work. So we met up quite a few times. He asked me a sort of personal questions and things and um, uh, stuff about my dad. And then we sort of pieced it together um, and then thought, right, let's let's perform it. Let's take a stab at the... Uh, Brighton Fringe. Initially we wanted to try and get to the Edinburgh Fringe Festival but uh, we wanted to make sure that it was right before we took it so we did a GoFundMe uh, page and uh, yes we tried it at the Brighton Fringe Festival 2018. Didn't know what to expect and then thankfully we got uh, five five star and four star reviews that came out of it so we did something right which was, uh, which was nice but it's a bit bizarre really because um, with the story, it's about uh, my dad's sort of um, rise to um, stardom before sort of three, two, one, um, performing with sort of names of Premier Como and uh, Bing Crosby for the people who wouldn't know of my dad who grew up in the 80s and then sort of his downfall and how that affected me and then my life. So it was a bit weird from living it, sort of putting that in a show and then see, seeing people's reactions from it and how they would sort of feel. So um it was very interesting to kind of see that really it was a bit a bit weird in a way that it could be a bit of a therapy play in some sort of lines i suppose um but what i found marvel um, quite amazing was afterwards in fact that you feel that you've shared your stories that other people would then come up and sort of share their story of how they remember my dad watching him but also finding out about this other man who they didn't know um, behind like the famous three to one hand signature that there's sort of more to him um, and what had um, sort of happened in the pro season where sort of my life sort of begins and how my career sort of uh, developing from there so I think it's quite nice in the fact it's different to any other sort of play that in Morecambe is or Wisdom of a Fool is the fact that it's a theatre documentary I suppose um, but it sort of gives something extra and the fact there's no actor playing my dad it's 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 literally me which is a bit crazy i suppose <laughs> his boy that's it yeah it did help you then therapy wise with, uh, with speaking about i it. guess so yes but more so in effect of sort of showing people that there was more to my dad than just three to one although three to one was brilliant and sort of giving him the sort of household name it was just a shame that people sort of lost out on what my dad had done previous to then in the fact that he was one of the hosts of Sunday Night at the Palladium to being a host at the Royal Variety and then working with Perry Como and uh, like Bing Crosby. I still find that so weird that he worked, mm. that Bing Crosby just r rang up my dad and said, <laughs> look, I, wanna, I want to work with you. I just find that so strange. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I kind of, although three to one was brilliant, I've, it had that sort of cheesy vibe that I didn't want my dad to be associated with just being 
a cheesy 80s presenter and the fact that there was more to him than that not just as a performer but also as the man that I knew dad really was dad very different then to the TV persona um no I guess like everybody have your off days and things but um no if anything what I learned from him in the fact is that family always meant everything to him really he would do anything for his family and I think that was a marvellous sort of lesson to sort of show and the fact that he had hard times like most people have but he didn't he didn't sort of sit back and go all right well that's it he kind of right, gone right okay these are the cars i've been dealt with this is where i need to progress to now and this is what i need to do um and sort of taking any sort of showbiz job with it might be pride wasn't really an element at all to him it was just a case of right i just need to get out and and do it um which i think was a marvelous sort of example he set to uh his well me and and my sister and his family Losing him at 11 then must have been traumatic. Hmm. Yeah, it was hard, yeah. Um, well, it's, well it's, your, it's your parent. It's the guy who's one of your parents who's brought you into the world. And it's what was, well, it's, it's weird and, and difficult in so many levels. And the fact that you've lost your dad, you've lost somebody who's also famous to a certain calibre of people. And then you've also got your mum who's not, well at the same time you've kind of got all elements there that have, mm. you're kind of dealing with all at the same time rather than just going I've, I've just lost my dad there's all these other elements in there that are happening so you just get a bit frustrated you're 11 as well and it's mm. obviously you're just developing secondary school and everything like this and mm. big changes in life well yeah you're well you're just starting to sort of become a teenager and then a man and the person who you kind of need for that isn't well, isn't there anymore um so yeah it was yeah it wasn't easy um but luckily enough I had the support with sort of family and friends and then um my foster parents have been amazing so that kind of from a horrible situation kind of made it into an amazing situation and I guess thinking about it in a weird way I guess I I wouldn't change it because I wouldn't have my if my dad were to be around today I wouldn't have my foster parents I wouldn't have that other family now that I now have so it's weird really in the fact that like you although it'd be great to have my dad back I would miss out on the other life so you wouldn't know where it would have gone I suppose in that sort of way if if he were to be around and would would he be suffering more so I I don't know you, you just don't know these sort of answers to these questions um but I am lucky in the fact that I've as we said earlier, I've got all this archive footage of him that for people who lose a parent who aren't famous or somebody that they love, then they only have the pictures and maybe one home video, but that's all they have. So I'm very lucky in the fact that I've got, well, literally the World Wide Web. In fact, I can find out every day there's like a new piece of information about my dad that I had no clue about, which uh, which somebody posts up and you go, gosh, he worked with this person or he went and this happened or somebody had this story about him um never never knew that so you each day pretty much i'm learning something new about him that i didn't know that you kind of have to reflect upon and then go okay i guess i can learn more now about this man who isn't here anymore um to the man i knew when i was growing up to how i would sort of coincide with him now me being 30 what would he be like i guess um so yeah, so it's a bittersweet, I suppose, in that way. We spoke earlier on about talking pictures before we started recording. <laughs> yes. And they're showing a lot of the old uh, Sunday Night at the London Palladiums and your dad's been <laughs> popping up on those as well, hasn't yeah, he? Yes, he has. Are you finding that as well? You know, the, the new footage is coming out, broadcast to the nation well not so i guess not so much that i suppose because i managed to uh because i sold dvds of the show so i guess that's that's sort of been like a uh, uh something i've already seen but it's still nice that it gets uh put out again just not got to read the comments that are on twitter or social yeah. media as such got to sort of put them to a side and be like it was a different era then it's fine 
Um, but yeah, I guess it's 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 nice to know that there's other things that are being shown of Dad that that are not just sort of three, two, one. There's other parts to him that people get to see and go, oh gosh, the, this was the act that was on at this time or this was happening. So it's nice the fact that he sort of, in a way, in the public eye, I suppose, in some sort of means, he's back out on a um, on TV again, which is lovely to watch. The sketches as well, I think. Like <laughs> he had lots of fun doing those. Yes, well, it's, it's funny actually, because the routine he had with, uh, Sasha Testel was written by um, Wally Motson who for some that don't know he wrote quite a lot for sort of Bob Monkhouse and uh, Bruce Forsyth and things and I've still got the paper that he had uh, typewriter on for their script uh, which has sort of uh, been kept away so it's quite amazing to go crikey they, this is the script that they both used at the Palladium and here it is still like in sort of pristine condition um, uh, I mean, there's other things that I've sort of found from the archives of sort of um, scripts from like the Ronnie Corbett sort of show and this, that and the other. And it's just quite sort of surreal, really. But yeah, it's it's lovely that things like that are like hidden gems that get sort of repeated from time to time. And people of that era who love watching it go, oh, yeah, I remember watching this. Or it's nice to watch it again. Or gosh, how times have how times have changed. <laughs> There's no flares or sideburns anymore. <laughs> um, which, I, yeah, I, I kind of uh, enjoy sort of seeing that, really. And seeing, <laughs> and seeing Dad with grey hair, <laughs> which didn't last very long. <laughs> oh, was he quite... Oh, very much so, yes. <laughs> well, yes, he would... Hilariously, he would sort of say... Um, uh, he would always lie about his age... Um, his brother who was younger than him he went to his 60th birthday and as we drove back in the car my sister was sort of questioning the banners and saying well hang on a minute you're older than uncle Len, aren't you and he went no 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 that was just a joke they just put that up he's not really 60 and as young kids we believed him and thought <laughs> that was a lie so we were constantly not wearing but yeah he would always dye his hair and things I mean hilariously looking back now and watching sort of three to one you do look at his hair and go oh why dad that was such a bad hair dye job it does look like a wig I know it's not but it looks like a wig <laughs> um, but yeah he was very proud he always used to say in his stand up never surrender he would always use all of Oulé and things like that. Make a joke saying it shrinks everything. Well, almost. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think if yeah, if he was if he was still alive today, he'd still be using uh, hair dye in his hair. I don't think he would ever give in and that sort of line or uh, means. It was hilarious because always looking at my uncle and he always looked older than my dad compared to him because he just went naturally grey and things. <laughs> but dad was never like that at all. Um, so yes he was definitely quite proud of being sort of young I suppose <laughs> in that sort of time and in, in frame of mind but yeah he would always knock off his age and never would he would always say oh yeah I'm 49 and I'm like all oh, right yeah okay <laughs> I mean I do remember as a kid going can I tell people you're 60 yet no oh why <laughs> why it's just a number I don't understand and obviously now I'm like okay yeah it makes sense right fine <laughs> But he only took two years off his age. I don't understand why that was. I don't know why he just didn't go, oh, just take 10 off. But he, but, but always used to say he was born in 1935. But no, he wasn't. It was a little bit a little bit earlier than that, <laughs> which I probably hate to say. How do you look after yourself then when you're getting ready for pantos and things like that? You said that, you know, he's the old oil of a Well, I, I guess I'm a bit... Well, at, at that moment, I feel like I'm, I haven't gone grey yet, so I'm all, I'm all right. I, I suppose I kind of... Um, I don't know. I guess I sort of maybe try and like think, right, I need to get sort of fairly fit because we're about to start. But normally in rehearsal, sort of jumping around like a headless chicken, the weight sort of soon goes off. I mean, I've been quite lucky. The metabolism sort of lasted quite well, but I think hitting the 30s and lockdown, I think it's crept back up on me. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I think especially in Panto doing two or three shows a day, that that certainly, if that doesn't keep you fit, I don't know what will really, and that sort of means. Um, but no, have sort of joined, have joined the gym and been doing a, shabam as they call it which has uh, <laughs> been hilarious all these all these women and then there's just me lucky enough there's a 
this is a male dancer teacher so that at least makes me <laughs> feel a little bit better <laughs> um but yeah i guess that kind of keeps me uh, sort of fit and this that and the other but uh um yeah i suppose as i get older i think i might need to think maybe using hair dye i don't know oh you can't do that now it's <laughs> uh it's it's now the cool thing isn't it the, oh, what to be the silver fox the silver fox yeah yeah i suppose yes i guess so I, well especially with lockdown nobody's been able to get her the hair done or anything <laughs> everyone's everyone's natural now you go oh that's what you look like right okay <laughs> <laughs> we'll go with that that's fine <laughs> ah, it's cool now isn't it yeah, yes what well i'm going that? with it and i'm sticking with it <laughs> what about your favorite routines to take part in then during pantomimes uh well, I guess I'm the, well, I guess if you call it old school, I, I love the sort of um, little bit of heaven routines um, or slosh, anything sort of slapstick I love because it's so visual and I think it works, especially with today, everything's on your phones and this, everything's so visual. I think it works quite nicely. Yeah, sorry for the bell, that's Max, my cat, not me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I think it, I think that kind of works. I th- especially watching it from a kid i love the little bit of heaven routine for those who don't know it's just a sandbag that comes down and everybody goes oh do you know that song a little bit of heaven oh how's it go well you go a little bit of heaven fell throughout the sky and then out comes a a uh, sandbag that comes down and hits them on top of the head and they go oh right oh so and so is catching all right let's get them we'll do it with them um but obviously it doesn't go to plan each time they do it they move and the sandbag comes down um, which I think is fantastic because the audience are in on the gag, the actors on or comedians, performers on stage are in on it. And hilariously, it can go wrong as a, as the only video footage I've got of my dad doing panto. The sort of sandbag that they used wasn't really a sandbag. It was more of a pillow that was in a huge sort of cover. And each time it would move, it would never hit the person where it should do. <laughs> so each time you go, there's no point singing it here because it doesn't hit you. And there's no point singing it on the spot because it doesn't hit you there either. Um, but I, I I don't know. I like those sort of old sort of slapstick routines. And especially with the, the Patton Brothers ice cream gag. I uh, loved, love that. One of my favourites. Yeah, absolutely love that. Because it's so, you know what's going to happen and you're just <laughs> waiting for it. Um, but it's just magic. And especially watching uh, Jimmy and Brian uh, do that each time. you just It was just magic to watch and how they just kept doing it, knowing full well what was going to happen, but still doing it as if it's the first time was just magic. Sheer professionalism to watch. So I think I love those sort of routines. And definitely one that's not really done so much, I suppose, because it's quite expensive routine, is the bathroom routine. Love that one. I mean, I remember watching my dad do that and I said, oh, you don't do that anywhere else. He said, well, it's quite a, it's quite cost effective. I think it was something like £300 in the early sort of 90s, whatever it is now. God knows. But I know that um, Evolution Panto sort of keep that tradition going with that routine, which is uh, great to see. Um, but yeah, I kind of like those sort of ones, the silly slapstick. They're the ones that I go, yeah, these are, this is what Panto is all about or a cooking routine. Um, I guess I'm sort of the old school in that sort of way, but that's that's what takes my box. I know some people are different. I don't know. I don't know if that's something that you particularly I like. I adore a slosh scene. Yeah. And I think that all children should see it. All children should play and try and emulate these things. And health and safety, uh, what's that? Let's, let's just <laughs> yes, have a bit of, it doesn't uh, work. A Not bit of slush. controlled chaos or <laughs> uncontrolled chaos. Well, I loved it. Well, me uh, me and Mark James, we did a, a slosh routine in uh, in Malvern and that was that was great fun. Um, we did it with the um, Widow Tranky's uh, laundry and these buckets of slosh keep coming down and you've got to not pull the lever. What did he say? Don't pull the lever and don't make a mess. And sure enough, we pulled the lever. And then as it, it sort of comes down slowly, but hilariously, there'll be some that literally would just come at the speed these buckets. And if you didn't, if you weren't there to catch them, it would be either on you or you'll be on the floor <laughs> before you could say slosh. Um, but yeah, just so much fun. And hearing the audience reaction from it is, well, it's nothing, nothing else like it really. But yeah, no, I've, I love those because you can have so much fun and just chaos and just 
build and build and build from it can't you really and just have well loads of fun that and getting the audience wet I love that yes yes especially when they're not especially when they're not thinking it's going to happen <laughs> <laughs> or they're, it's beyond the front two rows I yes. like that yes. as well well we did that uh, for Pirates in Weymouth we had um some sort of little uh, sort of small um squirt guns that would probably get like maybe the front row if they were lucky and then have the gag of oh these aren't going that far i know let's use these swap them and get something else that we get like the further five rows and then go hang on a minute this this isn't even getting the balcony let's use these and there'll just be a massive super soaker that will <laughs> literally get everybody um which i think is marvelous in the fact well everybody's then included aren't they really no one's no one's <laughs> no one's left un, un, <laughs> unsquirted I suppose in that way it's everybody's going home soaked so yeah I think that's it's all part of the fun isn't it really do you get nervous before performing uh yeah I would say so yeah very very nervous and the fact of going oh what they're gonna what's the audience gonna be like how they're gonna sort of take to this um I think once you've once you've gone on stage and you've got that bit, once you've got that adrenaline rush that gets you on the stage, I think then you could go, right, okay, now I can have my breather. Now we can sort of uh, carry on. So yeah, I would I would definitely say that. And never, whoever says to never get nerves, I uh, think's rubbish. I think I would always have nerves, and you always go, is it worth it for these nerves? And then you go on stage, you go, oh, yeah, it's certainly worth <laughs> it. <laughs> it's definitely worth it for this sort of uh, adrenaline rush before you get out, and then just ride the wave of that of that adrenaline rush after that from the audience and you go yeah this is this is what it's worth and the phenomenon of the panto blues do you get that yeah because you've well it's you've sort of made a new family haven't you really you've met all kinds of uh, life not only performers but backstage musicians um, and you've all come together you've all been part of this process you've had this script that was literally just writing now you've put it up on its feet each bit each bit by a uh, few hours here and then going over this bit of choreography and stuff so you're all part of this piece and then before you know it it's over and and you go oh but not only is the show over but all those people you work with you don't get to really see them all together again unless you might be able to work with them in certain bits, but you're never all together as you were before. So I would certainly say yes, as an element of panto blues, that you go, oh, that was that was really good fun, and then you go, right, right, come on, next panto now, come on, let's let's do it all again in a whole new new way. Um, so yeah, I definitely say I get pantomime blues and that sort of means because you've just had a great time and it's Christmas, everyone's enjoying themselves. Um, and then Christmas is over and you're like oh great now it's January <laughs> get planning for the Easter pantos yes exactly yes do you like the Easter and the summer pantos uh, I do I, I I don't mind them I, I guess there's not as there's not as much hype I suppose compared to a Christmas one because Christmas is completely different the fact that oh it's Christmas we're all getting all the family's going to get together we're going to get presents and things so you won't obviously get that from an Easter in some ways maybe easter eggs i suppose but some are not so much um so i guess it loses that bit of magic but in terms of audience i would say they're still up for being entertained being part of this always like saying still it's behind you or whatever's going on so i still say that's still there but i guess it sort of misses that little element of the spectacular of it being christmas and there's all these other shows that are going on because it is the pantomime season um but at the same time i still enjoy doing it i'm still i'm still on stage i'm still performing so um i guess it depends i suppose on what kind of story you use if you use something like mother goose and an easter panto i guess it works with the time that's happening and something like um pirates the pavilion works because it's specific to that venue and it works because it's summer and they know it's summer we're going to play off that so i think it as long as it works with the mood then it's fine i would say um but yeah i don't think you could beat it being at christmas time a panto i think that's i think it's definitely more magical at that moment is there anything you don't like about pantomime Uh, now that's a question uh i think i don't know Mm, i no i don't think so i don't think so i think i 
I know that's no I, I guess I, I love doing it I love being part of the sort of process the only I guess the most annoying part is trying to get it in my head the whole uh, sort of script and things that's what I find frustrating is like I want to get this in now <laughs> um, and sort of make sure all the routines are in so I suppose I only get annoyed at trying to get the sort of dance routines in my head earlier than previous uh, sort of straight away but but no I, I find it sort of magical in the fact you get to work with all kinds of life and things and you get I just, I just see it as just great fun more than anything as it as it should be I think if I I think if I found it in sort of uh, I didn't like it or boring or anything then I'd be like right I must I must change this now I can't be doing this anymore <laughs> um, but no I thoroughly love it I thoroughly enjoy it I don't think um, obviously apart from this Christmas Saturday I don't think I could see not doing panto in that sort of way by any sort of shape or form um, no I honestly really enjoy it what do you do then during the rest of the year? Um, sort of uh, bits and bobs, really. Kind of sort of either, as you said, sort of Easter sort of pantos or summer pantos. Uh, sort of done presenting shows, uh, whether it being sort of city or, or Fredo or uh, musicals. So anything that sort of goes off that kind of keeps me uh, occupied and things. Um, and then sort of, in between times I've sort of been look, doing uh, guest lecturing at my previous university at Chichester University doing sort of musical um, and pantomime so that kind of keeps me keeps me occupied and keeps my hand in um, so yeah that sort of I guess keeps me busy in that sort of time period and then before you know it it's pantomime season again you're like well hey it's come it's come round <laughs> back back we go um so yes that certainly is my i say pantomime is definitely my favorite time of the year any uh musical or west end roles that you'd still like to play um i'd love to do the mc and cabaret again that would be that'd be a role i'd love to uh reprise again whether in a west end show that would be um amazing because i had such a great time doing that at uni um and the fact that he's such a mysterious sort of character that you can do anything and that sort of means but i mean if if somebody said oh you're going to be in this show in the west end i'd be like yes yeah fine <laughs> we, we are, any anything i'll be i'll be happy with really um i mean I, I, I would love to do sort of singing in the rain but i don't think my dancer would be as to a <laughs> as the scratch for something <laughs> like that in that sort of way um but uh i think the ultimate dream would be to play at the Palladium. That would be, that would be ultimate. Well, for any performer, isn't it really? I suppose, unless that's answered one of your questions that you were going to ask. I suppose it has. <laughs> well, we we always ask the last question, the dream panto question. But we'll come into that. In, <laughs> we'll come into that in a bit. The how important was it going to uni and studying musical theatre? Um, I would say it was very uh, important uh, to me because I got to see sort of how, well, how shows are put on, how you get to see the people working backstage, how you how you make up a sort of stage manager's sort of portfolio and the fact that, oh, gosh, you've got these cues that are going on here and you've got to write along here that this is when the lighting cue goes and the pyro. It taught me all that um, other side of theatre that I didn't really know that much about from just being a performer. So it gave me that other side and then getting used to uh doing a lot more sort of dance classes um in sort of other genres i mean i did do dance for a level but nowhere near doing other sort of classes in more sort of jazz and tap um and ballet so that kind of gave me a whole extra sort of more of technique and sort of stamina um but then uh, i guess sort of finding out other sort of musicals really uh, and getting uh, getting to know more people and then seeing what other parts that I enjoyed doing there was also parts that we got to go into the community that we uh, could go in schools and sort of do drama with them so that was quite interesting in fact going oh, okay now we can sort of influence some other children who don't normally do drama or what they like and see it from their perspective because obviously you like doing it yourself but now you get a chance to see from a child if they might get influenced and what they like doing which was quite an eye-opener um, so that was quite good fun um, but yeah I think it kind of gives you 
um, other stuff as well, sort of more as skills just as yourself. You're not with your you're not with your folks. They're not doing your washing anymore. You're sort of sorting that for yourself. You kind of become a bit. You find a bit more of your personality, really. And I think that's kind of important. Um, I don't think you kind of get that as such. Probably in being, I guess it depends on who you are. But I think from being at university, that kind of opened that up to me and sort of seeing all different people from all kinds of backgrounds and where they came from so it's nice that everybody sort of collaborated together I mean I was in my first year I wasn't with musical theatre students I was with uh, the PE guys so that was quite quite interesting really I mean hilariously I would get the bus um, it would go from Chichester down to Bognor and I have to get it at nine o'clock and I wouldn't get in till about six and hilariously the PE lot would be going you're not going to uni mate you're going to work <laughs> But I, I, I loved it. But it was nice to sort of get those two different sides, really, and being with the guys on my course and seeing what they're like enjoy doing, as well as the PE guys. I got to find out what they were doing with their studies and um, how their days had been and sort of interact with them. So I think it was, I think uni is quite an important place to just, yeah, just sort of find yourself. And, and, and with the course, I got to find out other sort of, um, modules especially looking in Bollywood and other types of sort of musical theatre that I'd never really sort of dreamed about venturing into until we sort of started to do it really um, so that in some ways kind of worked out quite nicely to sort of go back as a guest lecturer which is quite surreal to be like crikey I was here as a student I was here as in freshers <laughs> week this is mad um, to be back here and sort of teaching the first years of uh, of today so but yeah it's uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed myself down there and I think it kind of helped me get the training that I needed to then go right okay I've done my training now I'm ready now to go on to the next thing and I think as well being at university as well as being an entertainer in Mallorca that kind of gave me extra skills to going right okay university is very good in sort of becoming a performer and finding out more stuff in terms of uh, other genres and other getting my portfolio together but actually being out in Mallorca now doing it you're learning obviously as you go along what what works and what doesn't work so yeah I think with both of those coinciding it kind of gave me quite a good grounding I would say is there anything you do differently um uh is there anything I do differently uh I don't know to be honest with you um Max has just jumped on the table. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't think I would, to be honest. I think I'm kind of happy as uh, the route that I've gone down, I would say. Um, I, I don't think there's, certainly not in the career that I've uh, gone down and the, and the plays and things that I've done. I think I've taken every opportunity as it's come by. So I don't think I sort of regret anything in that way. Um, no, I think I'm kind of, I'm kind of glad I think how how things are sort of progressed and where to go I don't think there'd be anything that I would no I don't think there'd be anything I would change I suppose thinking about it well this leads me on to my last question your dream pantomime so you could be in it you could be in the stalls watching it you choose the production and your cast can be alive or dead okay uh well i think it's going to be at the palladium isn't it let's be honest that's obvious <laughs> um uh i'd love i'd love to have my dad in it i think uh maybe with him that would be amazing uh do i need to cast who's in it yes you do yeah okay so uh i guess have my dad as the comic part then uh I mean, I, I wouldn't even mind just being a tree. I wouldn't even care. I'd just yeah. have, be something just to be on stage is fine by me. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Aladdin, I suppose. Dad is wishy washy. Get Robin Williams as the genie. Oh, brilliant. That would be quite epic. Uh, have the Patton brothers as the policemen, two Chinese of policemen. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, I guess I would get. John Chalice to be Abenazza again. That would be quite nice. Um, 
Well, I guess I could be the little monkey then, couldn't I, really, if it's Aladdin? I know he's not, not he's in the Disney version, but we'll put it in for this one, just for spark. Uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that would be it, really. I can't think of... Uh, I guess I've got to think of principal characters, haven't I, I suppose? Yes. Um, well, why not? Let's Since there's no budget, let's get Hugh Jackman as Aladdin. Why not? And get for uh, Princess Jasmine... Um, so you've got to get it in the right age range now, haven't you? <laughs> With <laughs> Hugh Jackman, I suppose. I don't know. Uh, I don't know. Why not? It's, uh, Nicole Kidman, why not? Let's see what she's up to. I don't know. Is maybe mm. Princess Jasmine. I don't know. I'm sure she'd do it. Yeah. A couple of quid a week. Yeah, she'll be all right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Throw in a hamster, that'll be okay. <laughs> don't know why. Well, no, thank you so much for taking part. No, in the thank you very much for having me, Hayden. It's been terrific. Thank you. Talk about